The trustees of the Tate are ignoramuses to a man and a woman. Who they listened to were two activists on Instagram from a group called White Pube. It's not education, it's self-flagellation. In this video, we are going to watch Douglas Murray take on British politician and former arts minister Ed Vasey on the topic of cancelling classic artwork. This is just another case of Douglas Murray completely wiping the floor with an individual who has no place stepping to the master of ancient verbal Shaolin Kung Fu. And it's also one that is close to my heart and it's one that I am in a deep and categorical agreement with Douglas about. Because I am of the well-founded opinion that the attack on classic art and literature is not only one of the most disgusting and despicable aspects of wokeness, but also the sign of a culture that is suffering immense and almost irreversible decadence. And even if you're not a big fan of this type of subject, I would recommend you stick around until the end because there is a lot to be learned here. And this is very important. So with that, let's get into the clips. Douglas, for the cover piece this week, you have written about the culture wars infiltrating museums. What's been happening? Well, I start off with a, um, a description of going to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford this past week. Uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum has always been an interesting oddity of a museum, a collection of, of, of mainly 19th century uh, collected artifacts. Uh, it's, um, it, it was a, a place famed, among other things, for the pickled heads that it had in it. And even as an undergraduate more than 20 years ago now, uh, it, was, it, was, it was known of as being an oddity, but an oddity from another time. Um, and I discovered on returning this week that it's now become uh, an oddity of our own time. Uh, the museum is filled with condemnations of the museum. The collection is filled with condemnations of the collection. Almost everything tells you about the sins of European colonialism, European racism. There are, of course, all of the nods to the religion of our time. There are segments on beyond the binary, because I'm sure that's what everybody wants when they go to the Pitt Rivers collection. And we see, for instance, anime characters from the 1990s who are strong queer icons. Uh, my point is that the museum is effectively abolishing itself. It's saying that the collection was put together by bad forces and it has to be saved in the modern era, reinterpreted and indeed accused. Now this, as I say in my cover piece this week, is not at all unusual. It is something that is going on that collection after collection and museum and muse after museum across the land. And the the oddity of this is not just that this is in fact encouraged by, for instance, the Museums Association, which, which tells collections in, Europe, in, in the UK how to, quote, decolonize, but of course that the collections themselves are doing it. We just saw last weekend the Welcome Collection on London's Euston Road announcing that it was closing its exhibition. Why? because it had tried to decolonize, but it couldn't tear itself away from its dead white male origins. And so the Welcome Collection announced that it would be closing. It couldn't justify itself, so in the end, it stopped. So just to add a bit of context here before we get into the back and forths, in case this is something that you haven't been following very closely. Museums and art exhibitions around Europe have been going through a process called decolonization. This means that they are decoupling themselves from the dark and evil individuals that preceded them, but more specifically individuals that are inextricably linked to the evils of colonialism. This means that they are going through classic pieces of artwork with a fine tooth comb to try and find something that could be deemed as offensive to the people of today. And we all know that you won't have to look too far to find that. And obviously it goes without saying that it would be a tragedy if people were to be offended by art. Because we all know that the point of art is just to make you feel comfortable and familiar. And furthermore to that, you should feel especially safe and comfortable and familiar when you look at historical art. As if you're just sitting in your living room. It's not at all like these beautiful pieces of art are meant to give you a visceral and transcendent glimpse into the times that they were created. No, no, no. And also thank God for these activists because without them, then I would never have known that bad things happened in history. 
and I definitely wouldn't be able to just interpret these artworks on my own. I personally need them to tell me what to think. So by now you might be able to tell by my sarcasm that I am not impressed by this and I genuinely think that some of the worst and dumbest people in the world are curating these galleries or they're just total cowards. I mean I don't see any other way you can describe people who engage in these activities. Now let's let Douglas Murray get into the weeds of this issue and I'll add more context and thoughts as we go. And this is where Douglas may well disagree with me so we'll get some juice out of this. Uh, that it is worth thinking about cultural seven, uh, sensitivities in the 21st century. I mean, he cites the Rex Whistler mural at Tate. Now, I wasn't a trustee of Tate when the trustees made the decision to close the restaurant because the images of, uh, uh, in the mural were deemed to be offensive. But I respect their decision. It wasn't taken lightly. It was thoroughly... Uh, examined, And I'm afraid it is the case that in the 21st century, a lot of people wandering into the restaurant and seeing Rex Whistler's mural, regardless of the context, would find those figures offensive. And it was on the table to have an explainer or whatever about why those figures were there. Uh, but it was considered very carefully. And I, I support that this is the key point. I support trustees looking at these issues uh, and making decisions on that basis. What uh, Ed Vesey mentions about, uh, I'm glad he s says that I use strong examples in my piece, and I'm sure he'd expect that. There's no point in writing and using weak examples. Uh, but the example of Tate Britain, um, I think, uh, with all due respect, Ed is entirely wrong about. The Tate trustees took the collection with extraordinary levity. The trustees of the Tate are ignoramuses to a man and a woman. Before we continue this video, guys, if you don't mind hitting that thumbs up, it would help me enormously with my algorithms, pushing this video out far and wide and helping to spread the message of Rattlesnake TV. And if you guys haven't subscribed, welcome to the family. Every single one of them, and let me explain briefly why. The Rex Whistler mural was commissioned in the 1920s. It includes two tiny figures of black children clearly in distress being pulled by women in frilly frocks, laughing. It's clearly, as any scholar or fan of Rex Whistler knows, something he does in all of his murals, which is to say, et in Arcadia ego. This is a, 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 um, a fantastical, idyllic scene in which he deliberately, across all four walls, puts in tiny details to say, even in this alleged paradise, the worm of human evil exists. The trustees of the Tate did not consider this. Who they listened to were two activists on Instagram from a group called White Pube. White Pube's slogan is, F the police, F the UK, F the Tate. Now, I don't need to tell Lord Vesey, F the Tate is not a chant you often hear on the streets of London. Most people don't have that strong views on Tate Britain. This was a malevolent, tiny group of activists who decided to defame Rex Whistler. The trustees of the Tate, far from looking into this, immediately got scared. They closed the room, they took Rex Whistler's name off it, they defamed him first of all as a racist, and then put up a sign saying that he had the racist view views of his time. Why do I mind this? Not just because the Tate is meant to house and look after one of our great collections, but because Rex Whistler died childless fighting on his first day in Normandy in 1944. How dare one of the great collections of the UK be in the hands of people who would defame as a racist somebody who joined up on the first weeks of the war in 1939 and laid down his life fighting Nazism. These people are not looking at these things carefully any more than they have the example of Stanley Spencer, who they've also decided to defame in their collection as a racist. These collections are in the hands of people who are unworthy of the things in their care. Okay, so this particular part of the conversation is about the floor-to-ceiling mural that Rex Whistler painted at the Tate Museum restaurant. You can see the article by the Guardian here that says Tate's unequivocally offensive mural 
to have new work alongside it. Tate Britain Commission will be in dialogue with Rex Whistler's 1927 mural and its racist imagery. So the decolonizers have come for this magnificently beautiful work of art. Why? Because there are a few images within the piece that are considered racist. But what their pea brains didn't realize is that not only is this an aesthetically beautiful piece of art, it's also philosophically profound. Far too profound for the absolute ignorance Ramuses, as Douglas Murray rightly called them, that seek to cancel it. Now, Douglas mentioned here that these depictions are very intentional and something that Rex Whistler does in all of his murals. And he mentioned the idea of et in Arcadia ego. And this is a Latin phrase that translates literally to even in Arcadia, there am I. This is to say that even in the most peaceful and utopian of settings, there is always darkness. And this is an idea that was inspired by the likes of Virgil in his early eclogues, and then was explored by Goethe and Pope Clement IX and Nicholas Poussin in his painting Et in Arcadia Ego. This is a painting of a classical and idealized pastoral scene where the shepherds from antiquity are examining a tomb with an inscription that reads Et in Arcadia Ego, meaning that even in this beautiful, peaceful Arcadia, Arcadia meaning like a beautiful, unspoilt pastoral Pastoralism, a harmony with nature, a paradise, if you will. Death is always present. Now, this deeply philosophical notion is something that's been explored in many different ways by many brilliant minds and also explored in the reverse. Examples of which might be deriving beauty from suffering, the religious ideas, or tragedy plays. One might think of Shakespeare or more specifically Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet. This is to say that even in the most tragic of situations and scenarios, beauty can still be derived. All this to say Rex Whistler was not simply doing a racist thing, he was incorporating a deeply profound idea that has been explored over thousands of years. Now let's have a look at the activists that Douglas mentioned here who are trying to cancel these works. The White Pube are a completely unsophisticated, most likely unemployed and probably blue-haired postmodernist activist group who seek to destroy some of the most beautiful classic pieces of artwork in the country and have them removed from galleries because they are too lazy and stupid to ever create anything of importance or significance themselves. So what do they do? They try and tear everything down. So rant over, I'll let you make up your mind on which side of this argument you're on. And on to the next part. Putting aside some of the more extreme examples where they've just decided to shut down collections, would you have an issue with uh, curators deciding that rather than shutting things down, they would like to give a modern context um, and they would like to give more information to those visiting the museum? I mean, presumably that is their remit, of course, um, so that people really understand what they're consuming and perhaps some of the atrocities behind what they're consuming. Oh, yes, absolutely. By the way, Ed Vasey sets up a straw man, as politicians of his kind always do. No, nothing you would ever do, Douglas. <laughs> no, I don't need to, believe me. I don't need to. Um, he sets up a straw man by pretending that I or anyone like me thinks that we should preserve our collections in aspic. I don't believe that at all. I think that trustees obviously always have to reinvigorate and renew collections. What I think is strange is that they should hate the collections which they are in charge of. Again, I come back to the point. I followed, unlike Ed, extremely closely the activities at the Tate in recent years and also observed extremely closely the way in which they decided to make Stanley Spencer one of the other two great artists of the 20th century in their collection into a posthumous racist for no good reason at all. So yes, that's what I find strange. But to get back to your point, Kate, the interesting thing about this word retain and explain thing is it's absolutely fine and admirable so long as it isn't a one-directional political hit job. And let me give you an example of what a one-directional political hit job looks like. If you want to, for instance, say uh, uh, parts of this uh, museum were put together uh, by, in an era of colonialism in Europe or colonialism in Britain, fine. Who doesn't mind that? I don't mind that. I don't think anyone would mind that. But here's what I mind is when you, for instance, as at the Pit Rivers, get that, and then a strange silence on everywhere else in the world. For instance, the Kingdom of Benin, which has already come up a couple of times. If you stand before the display on the Kingdom of Benin in the Pit Rivers Museum in Oxford, do you learn anything about slavery? Curiously enough, no. 
Do you learn that the Kingdom of Benin was practicing slavery long after the British Empire decided to abolish it and sent its ships across the seas trying to stamp it out anywhere else? No. And you would leave believing that the rest of the planet lived in Eden until the wicked Europeans arrive. It's not education. It's self-flagellation. I think that uh, without wishing to descend into cliche, two wrongs uh, don't make uh, a right. And um, it is up to us to put into context the collections that we have in this country and how they were acquired. And 99% of them were acquired uh, perfectly uh, legitimately. And it's a great thing as well that we have these British institutions that display uh, an extraordinary range of artefacts and paintings from all over uh, the world. But I think when the Benin bronzes were looted, uh, that we should own up to that fact and think about returning them. But Ed, some of the Benin bronzes were given to this country by the Prime Minister of Nigeria after independence. What do we do with those? Uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to... Uh, I don't know enough about Robert Runcie's well, Benin bronzes. You haven't thought about it enough. But if he... Uh, if. Uh, do we not risk, by removing so-called offensive artwork, um, losing parts of history, losing those uncomfortable, offensive parts of history? Uh, do we not risk suggesting that these things never happened at all? And actually, to a more fundamental point about offense as well, since when is it wrong for art or great works of literature to be offensive? to challenge us, for us to be uncomfortable with what we see. If we decide that such works are too risky for people to be exposed to, what are we going to be looking at when we go into museums? What's going to be there to challenge us? I think it's a very fair challenge and I think it's a very nuanced debate and to a certain extent you should do it um, object by object. I think, as I say, I wasn't a trustee when uh, the Tate trustees considered the Rex Whistler mural, but they clearly took the view that these were effectively racial caricatures and no uh, attempt to put them in uh, context or whatever would necessarily uh, reduce the offence that a modern 21st century audience, whether it's black or white, would feel when they were coming in uh, to have uh, a nice lunch at Tate. So they'd taken that decision. And I think, you know, what I want to get across there, I think Douglas is to be frank, being very, very unfair to think that this was a sort of decision taken, uh, you know, in a nanosecond. Um, I'm being wild. Over, over a couple of um, digestive biscuits and a cup of tea. I think it was thought through very carefully over very well, many Can I ask Ed what he thinks about the Stanley Spencer by case? the trustees. Can I ask uh, well, Ed what he thinks what about the Stanley, Stanley Spencer case? Spencer, as far as I'm aware, Stanley Spencer is still on full display at Tate Britain and is yes. not called a racist in, by Tate or anyone else. I can assure you, this is very important with a former arts minister because you have to be on top of these things. I'm sorry, but as with the Benin bronzes, you have to be on top of this. The Tate well, I am on top of, of the of Benin bronzes. You know, the Horniman Museum has just returned the Benin bronzes to Nigeria. Nigeria yeah. hasn't thrown up its hands in horror and said, you shouldn't return the these. Tate. You've got them perfectly legitimately. Uh, and I'm on top of Stanley Spencer in the sense, as I say, Stanley Spencer remains on full display at right. Tate and but is you... not called a racist. Yes, he is. Go down there today, if you have the time, and you will see that his masterpiece, The Resurrection at Cookham, in, in the accompanying description, as I say in my piece, claims that Stanley Spencer used racialized images of black people. Now, it doesn't bother to say that in this extraordinary masterpiece, as I'm sure you'll agree it is if you know the painting, in this extraordinary masterpiece that displays the, the, the resurrection of the dead on the day of judgment in Stanley Spencer's church, nearby churchyard in Cookham, it shows people of all races emerging from the grave. You Again, this the, is you aligning, you, uh, you know, calling somebody a racist that is not calling him a racist. Go back to the quote I give in the piece. As with Rex Whistler, they look at the work in their, in their, tr in their care with the most hostile lens imaginable. There was nobody black in Cookham in the 1920s. I just, I'm so sorry, Stanley Douglas, Spence, I have to disagree please with let you Please let me that. finish. Finish your point, Ed response. I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to wrap up because we're well over time. Douglas, you have 30 seconds. A reasonable estimation of the Spencer painting in the Tate is that because there was nobody black in Cookham at the time, if you wanted to show the resurrection of all of humanity, yes, he relied on photographs from National Geographic. Does that make him a racist? Obviously not. Is it what he is impugned as being by Tate 
Yes. It's right by the painting. I don't agree that's the case at all. We'll go down and see it. So just for another bit of context here, Stanley Spencer is another brilliant artist who painted a painting called The Resurrection at Cookham, which is what they're talking about here. This is a beautiful piece of mastery whereby God and Christ are watching as all of humanity is resurrected. It's an homage to Stanley Spencer's deeply Christian beliefs that everyone will be raised from the dead to receive judgment or glory. And like Douglas said, there were no black people in Cookham at this time. So he went off of images that he'd seen in National Geographic because he wanted to incorporate all different kinds of people. But that's not the worst of it. In April of this year, Fitzwilliam Museum, which is governed by the University of Cambridge, took down another one of Stanley Spencer's paintings called Love Among the Nations. This is a painting that depicts contorted figures of various ethnicities kissing and embracing. How anybody could look at this and call it racist is beyond me. You can just look at this as a human being with a prefrontal cortex and realize that Stanley Spencer was progressive beyond his time. But when it was up, the label for the painting read as following. The image is powerfully shaped by his own ignorance and amounts to a series of racist caricatures. It added none of Spencer's human subjects escaped this taste for the grotesque, but the painting shows how this broadly misanthropic outlook intersected with an unquestioned racism. Raised on the moral rightness of British imperial rule, Spencer imagines civilization firmly in the West and savagery in the colonies. New conversations are developing about the status of paintings like this one. What should happen to pictures that contain offensive racial stereotypes, given their connection to the real suffering of generations of colonized and enslaved subjects? Nothing is what should happen to these paintings you idiots. And this museum is just another example of these flaccid, spineless jellyfish who are going about this decolonization of art and it is absolutely infuriating. And the label that I just read to you, they stuck with that next to the painting for six months before obviously they removed the painting for good, which is what they always do. Gradually, they impose their will on you inch by inch by inch until you're 20 miles down the road and you have no idea how the hell we got here. And this is nothing new. This is what revolutions have always done, inch by inch by inch. Masquerading as groups that just want equality and social justice and using young people, students for that matter, who are more susceptible to these ideas. It's easy to program them and create a visceral hatred in their minds for customs and traditions of old. And I really do hope that I am overreacting and sensationalizing here because this stuff genuinely does concern me. Now let's watch Douglas Murray ram the points home. To Ed and Douglas, uh, Ed to you first. Do you think that the uh, way in which museums are now curated and the way that art is presented to us has become too politicized? Or do you think that the interventions that are taking place now are crucial to a modern understanding of what happened in the past? Well, I started this uh, debate by saying that I agreed with a lot of uh, what Douglas wrote in his article. And as I say, I think that the extreme positions are taken on uh, both sides. And I think that on one side, questioning or uh, referring to the fact that, you know, some objects were acquired in, by dubious means were somehow being unpatriotic and un-British, or as Douglas is uh, in terms of working himself up just now, you know, that we're going around calling Stanley Spencer a racist, I think is ludicrous. But at the same time, I do accept that there are plenty of examples in our museums at the moment uh, where people have taken it to the other extreme and there are kind of gratuitous uh, labels and narratives that don't really fit. You know, I am quite woke on these issues. I mean, I see nothing wrong, for example, in terms of GCSEs and A-levels in extending uh, the English literature curriculum towards world uh, literature. I don't see anything wrong with those kind of things. And people foam at the mouth if you dare to suggest that children in British schools might study authors who uh, weren't born and bred in uh, Britain and wrote from outside. So I see nothing wrong with uh, looking at our curriculum, looking at, our, at the objects in museums, putting them in context and extending the range uh, uh, of objects that people see and... Uh, reimagining the narrative. 
Douglas, to what extent should politics feature in museum curation? And to what extent is it inevitable? I mean, ultimately, the people making these decisions will come with uh, not a neutral point of view. Uh, and, and you're always going to have some uh, lens put on what is presented to you. Um, the job of trustees of a collection is to ensure the continuation of the collection is to know that it is in your hands for your generation to pass on to the next one. I say in the piece how extraordinary it is that so much of what I described has gone on under a Conservative government. And I think Lord Vesey has just demonstrated why and how it has Please gone Please call me Ed. But, but as I say, I think that essentially what we have is that our national heritage is to a great extent in the hands of people who don't much care for it. Evelyn Ward, a famous essay in the Spectator reviewing uh, St Stephen Spender's memoirs, said, said that, that reading Stephen Spender, mangling the English language, was like watching a, a, a very valuable vase in the hands of a chimpanzee. Um, watching our national collections and their trustees and curators at the moment is like seeing all the most precious things in our culture in the hands of chimpanzees. They are utterly unfit for the task they've been appointed to. Exactly right. And these people are incompetent fools who are so easily swayed by the loud voices of activists. Activists who have had their minds conditioned and programmed at university and now are out in the real world looking for racism, ready to find it anywhere like a greyhound at the gate. But they are winning at the moment because people are too cowardly to stand up, say shut up, sit the hell down, you snotty nosed little brat, go back to dyeing your hair green and sitting at the skate park talking about the patriarchy. We don't need your tiny, insulated, ideologue brains telling us what artwork we can and cannot see. Nor do we need your condescending and historically illiterate labels for context or trigger warnings. I do not seek the perspective or the ill-gotten opinions of an intellectually diminutive activist when looking at the work of a creative giant. These works were made to be provocative and made to be open to interpretation and interpret we will. That would be my response anyways. So guys, as usual, hit those links in the bio, check out my other channels. If you guys want to watch another video, if you're into this sort of thing, I'll leave some more Douglas Murray videos right here. And until next time, I'm Jake, this is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.